Dear students, colleagues, and all the viewers who are watching this program live from Facebook page, Physics Center, I would like to welcome you all to our international web, uh, physics webinar. And today uh, it is our 28th webinar. So good afternoon to all. Hope you are well and uh, safe from Corona pandemic. And uh, we, are, uh, we are living in a uh, Corona pandemic situation. It is a very difficult time for us. And it is also a new experience for uh, all of us. And we're trying to adjust our, uh, our uh, life in a new normal situation. So we know that all the institutions have, uh, have been shut down uh, due to Corona uh, pandemic since uh, March 2020. And we're trying to uh, uh, continue our online program as we can't uh, uh, continue our uh, normal academic program. So our department, Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology have uh, taken some uh, uh, step uh, to continue online program. We have uh, started online classes and online uh, physics webinar. And I am happy to share with you that today it is our 28th physics webinar. And in those uh, uh, all physics webinar, the physicists from different countries are, uh, are coming as a main speaker and they share their experience with our student and they, uh, 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 they, they, they help our student by, uh, by, by, by giving their lecture. And today I'd like to welcome you uh, uh, through a joint session between our university, uh, Pabna University of Science and Technology and the McGill University Canada in theoretical uh, cosmology. And we have with us here today, Dr. Robert Brandenberger, Canada Research Chair, Prior One and Professor Department of Physics, Theoretical Cosmology, McGill University Canada. And uh, joining us uh, with, uh, uh, from Europe as he is now in a Europe tour and he have already connected uh, with us. So I'd like to welcome our speaker. So uh, good afternoon, sir. Hi. So I am also happy to share, share with you uh, that uh, he uh, was a, a postdoc student of uh, famous uh, Stephen Hawking. So this is also a great thing. So uh, I, you have already uh, came to know that uh, uh, we have arranged a series of web here. And, uh, and, and, and in that continuity, Today, we have got one of the best theoretical cosmologists uh, in the world, Dr. Robert Brandenberger, as a uh, main speaker of our webinar. And I hope this webinar will help our student lots, and it will create an opportunity for our student uh, to interact uh, with such a famous cosmologist. Uh, and and it, 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 it will help them to understand new things. So for those who are new uh, in our uh, webinar, so I'd like to uh, say that we have uh, divided our uh, webinar in three parts. First, uh, we'd like to introduce uh, our uh, speaker with you and then uh, there is a time where uh, our speaker will, will deliver his piece and at the end we have a discussion session where actually anybody can join with us and can ask questions. So before going to our speaker I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker with all. So I think uh, you have already came to uh, know that the title of our uh, today's uh, webinar status of early universe scenario and the uh, uh, the speaker of our today's uh, webinar is Robert Brandenberger. Uh, he is currently working as a Canada Research Chair, Prior One, and Professor Department of Physics, Theoretical Cosmology uh, at McGill University, Canada. If we see his uh, uh, academic background and career experience, so we can see that he have completed his diploma from ETH Zurich, Switzerland. Then he completed his PhD from Harvard University, USA in 1983. And then uh, he completed his first postdoc at uh, ITP, uh, Santa Barbara, USA, uh, in 1983 to 1985. And then he completed his uh, second postdoc from Cambridge University, uh, University UK, uh, in 1985 to 1987 under Stephen Hawking. Uh, then he joined as a professor at Brown University, and, and he worked there from 1987 to 2004. And from 2004 to present, he's now working as a professor at McGill in University. So if we uh, see his research, uh, research field theoretical cosmology and uh, the, the goal of the theoretical cosmology are twofold. The first one is to provide an explanation for the observed structure in the universe on the large scale. The second goal is to explain the history of the very early universe. According to our present ideas, the seed which developed into the observed structure in the universe are laid down in the very early universe and determined by the physics valid at the largest energies. Thus, cosmology is a normal meeting ground between the fundamental theory, uh, for example, superstring theory and quantum gravity and observation. 
So research area, inflation, uh, inverse cosmology, theory of cosmological uh, perturbation, transplankian physics, uh, reheating in inflation, and superstring cosmology, matter, Brown's uh, cosmology, topological defect in cosmology, signature uh, of cosmo, cosmic strings in a new of the notional window, and baryogenesis. Workshop, he has a lot of workshop experience, and uh, you can see his Wikipedia uh, account. So. Uh, thanks uh, all of your patience. Now it's time to go our uh, speaker. And I, I think this will be a great uh, day for our department and memorable day of our department as uh, we are arranging a webinar, international physics webinar with such a uh, famous uh, physicist. And also he's currently working as Canadian uh, research chair. So thanks, sir, for accepting our invitation. And it's your time. You can start your uh, lecture, sir. Great. So can you see the full screen? Yes, sir, we can see. It's okay, okay. Sir. Can you see the cursor? Yeah, we can, we can. Okay, good. And can it's you okay. hear me okay? Yeah, sound is clear, sir. Good, good. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, my research area and uh, give you a review of the status of early universe scenarios. So as Pretamardi mentioned, the goal of this research is twofold. We would like to explain the origin and early evolution of the universe, but we'd, we would also like to understand the observed features of the universe on large scales. So cosmology is a field that combines data, hard data, and very speculative questions about the early universe. This makes it an exciting field for me. So I want to start with a lengthy introduction. So the introduction probably will take almost half of the seminar. And the bottom line of this introduction is that we have several scenarios of early universe cosmology, which can explain the current data, not just one. So this is the goal of, of the long introduction. Now, the, the paradigm of early universe cosmology, the first scenario is called the inflationary universe scenario. And if you open astronomy textbooks now, they start by, this, their cosmology section starts with the statement, the universe began with the period of inflation. Well, uh, based on what I told you in the introduction, this is actually not true. We do not know whether inflation is indeed the correct scenario of early universe cosmology. So I'll give a brief review of what inflation is, what the inflationary scenario is, and then I will come to the controversial part of the talk. So for students in the audience, I will tell you that the first two sections are non-controversial. Nothing that I'll say in these two first sections are controversial. However, at this point, I will turn to more controversial issues. I will turn to attacks on inflationary cosmology. So as I'll explain, inflation is a toy model. And the question we should ask is, is the toy model of inflation consistent with fundamental physics? And I'll give you two sets of arguments which indicate that inflation might not be consistent with fundamental a theory. So these are two important sections. And then I will end with discussing briefly two alternative early universe scenarios. Okay. So before 1980, we had a standard paradigm of cosmology, which was called the standard big nine. And this is a nice, consistent classical theory. Space and time are described by classical general relativity, and matter is described by a superposition of classical ideal gases. One ideal gas, which we call cold matter, pressureless, and this is the stuff that makes up the main part of galaxies in galaxy clusters. And then there's the radiation, electromagnetic radiation, which we see in the microwave background. So these are the classical fundamentals of standard Big Bang cosmology. And standard Big Bang cosmology is completed by the assumption 
that space is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. And now this assumption is uh, confirmed by experiments. So this is the uh, standard Big Bang cosmology. And in the context of standard Big Bang cosmology, you can describe the separation of events in space-time. This is this ds square in terms of dt square, t is physical time, minus a of t square dx square. So if you have an expanding universe, then my coordinates x are coordinates which are expanding as space expands. And a of t is called the scale factor. And that tells you the size of the radius of a portion of space. Good. So standard Big Bang cosmology was successful. It explained Hubble's observation that space is expanding. And most importantly, it predicted the existence and black body nature of the cosmic microwave background. It also predicted the abundances of light elements. So these are the three main successes of standard Big Bang cosmology. So standard Big Bang cosmology tells us that the universe is expanding. So the horizontal axis is time. Vertical axis gives you an impression of the size of space. And according to standard Big Bang cosmology, there was a singularity at the beginning of time. And 300,000 years after that singularity, the universe had cooled to the extent that atoms could combine. And this combination effect released the photons, which we see as a microwave background. So it is this picture which led to the prediction of the existence of the microwave background and its black body nature. And so this is an experimental curve. So the vertical axis is intensity as a function of frequency. And this is the intensity of the cosmic microwave background at one point in space. And so you see this is a beautiful black body curve. And well, I said that this is an experimental curve. So where are the error bars? Well, the error bars are smaller than, than the thickness of this curve. So with this discovery, cosmology entered the period of precision cosmology. So this is a big success of standard Big Bang cosmology. However, standard Big Bang cosmology could not explain the large size and entropy of the universe. There was no explanation for the observed spatial flatness of the universe. So we don't see ourselves living uh, on the surface of a highly curved three-dimensional sphere, but we see ourselves living in something which is close to three-dimensional Euclidean space. And most importantly, in the context of what I just said, there's no explanation for the isotopy of the microwave background and no explanation for the origin of any structure in the universe. And I will illustrate these two points in terms of sketches. So this is the data. So this is a projection of the sky onto a plane, like a projection of the surface of the Earth onto a plane, North Celestial Pole, South Celestial Pole, Celestial Equator. And the experiment measures the intensity of the microwave background at each point in the sky. And then you translate intensity to temperature. And then you see that in different directions of the sky, you see the different temperatures. And so you see this incredible isotopy of the microwave background. So here, the temperature is plotted on a scale of 0 to 3.6 degrees Kelvin. But if you now zoom in and measure the microwave background with much higher precision, then if you look on a scale of 10 to the minus 4 of the absolute temperature, you start to see and isotopy is peeping out. You see hot spots and cold spots. So this, this is the W map results. So given this interesting map of microwave anisotopies, you can expand this map in spherical harmonics. And then you can plot the amplitude, so vertical axis, as a function of the angular scale for each spherical harmonic, spherical harmonic labeled by multiple, multiple moment L. So the black dots, that's the observation from this experiment, 
And you see that on small angular scales, angular scales comparable to the angular scale of the telescope, angular resolution of the telescope, you have statistical error bars, statistical errors. And on very large angular scales, you have some systematic uncertainty. Okay, now the red curve is a six parameter curve that fits the data fairly well. Now I want to now come to the question, who drew this curve? Well, first of all, let me go back to the problems of standard big bang cosmology. And this is an illustration of the horizon problem. So the vertical axis is time, horizontal axis is space. And we are here at now looking at the microwave background coming to us from opposite directions in the sky. So this dashed line, that's the time corresponding to the time when the microwave background was released. And the microwave background travels from when it is released to when we observe it without scattering. So now within standard big bang cosmology, the past light cone of this event is completely disconnected with the past light cone of event A. So therefore there's no causal way that we can tell point A to have the same temperature as point B. So standard big bang cosmology explains the existence and microwave and uh, black body nature of the microwave background, but it does not explain why the temperature in different directions of the sky is essentially the same. Now, we observe structures on large scales. We observe galaxies, galaxy clusters, the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background. And within standard big bang cosmology, there is no way to explain the origin of these fluctuations. So this is a sketch that illustrates this. The vertical axis is time. The horizontal axis is space. And here I'm using coordinates, which again, expand as space expands. Um, this is the time of eco matter and radiation. The universe is dominated by radiation early on and it's dominated by cold matter later. And this diagonal line is the horizon of standard Big Bang cosmology. So this point cannot communicate with any point in this region of space-time if you accept special relativity, so if you accept causality. Now, we observe today fluctuations on very large scales on a wavelength which I label here as d sub c. So if we track this wavelength back to the time of equal matter and radiation, then this wavelength is larger than the horizon. So now I give a homework problem to the graduate students and to the undergraduate students. In the following argument, I am sneaking in a hidden assumption. And you have to try to find out where the hidden assumption is. No textbook of, on cosmology will give you the answer. The textbooks all say exactly what I will say. So we observe non-random structures on this scale today. Structures on large scales evolve by gravity only. Gravity is a weak force. And so if there are fluctuations today, there had to have been seeds for fluctuations already at equal matter and radiation. And by causality, we cannot explain their origin. So here with these two uh, diagrams, I illustrated these two points. No explanation for the isotopy of the cosmic microwave background, no explanation for the origin of structure. Let me go forward. Okay. So now, the field, in the field of early universe cosmology, we claim that we can come up with a solution of these problems by modifying the theory in the very early universe. So we will depart from standard Big Bang cosmology in the very early universe. Good. So again, I remind you of the framework. We are looking at homogeneous and isotropic cosmology, time, space, scale factor, which is essentially the size of the universe. And this H of T is the Hubble expansion rate, A dot over A. Over a. So this is just notation. Good. 
So now, who first predicted this red curve? And the point I want to make for people who are graduate students and faculty is that this red curve was predicted 10 years before inflationary cosmology was developed. It was predicted by Jim Peebles and independently by Zunyaev and Zeldovich. And here is a sketch from the 1970 Zunyaev Zeldovich paper. So this is time, the vertical axis. Horizontal axis is my co moving coordinates. This is the standard Big Bang horizon. Now, the fact about fluctuations in homogeneities and the fact that you will have to accept for this lecture, but I can give you references if you want to understand this. If you take a plane wave in homogeneity with a wavelength bigger than this length scale here, which is a standard Big Bang horizon, then it will be frozen in. But when the wavelength becomes smaller than this uh, line, which I will call now Hubble radius, then it will start to oscillate. So just imagine uh, waves on a string and uh, they will oscillate. Now you see that the length scale which crosses the Hubble radius right at recombination has had no time to do any oscillation. So we catch the wave at its maximal amplitude. Waves come in as standing waves. Whereas a wave that has done a quarter of an oscillation, we catch it at a, at a node of the amplitude at maximal velocity and so on. So based on the fact that different wave numbers, different wavelengths undergo a different number of oscillations, that is direct, that for, from this picture, you predict the uh, oscillations in the angular power spectrum of the microwave background. Okay. So, again, I said this when I explained the graph. So, given a spectrum of inhomogeneities, fluctuations on super horizon scales before equal matter and radiation, and assuming that these fluctuations have a scaling around power spectrum, so the amplitude is independent of wave uh, number. And this scale invariance was known in 1970 to be in good agreement with the power spectrum of galaxies. Then this predicted the acoustic oscillations in the CMB angular power spectrum. So this red curve was predicted in 1970 by Zunia and by Peebles and you, um, 10 years before inflation. So this red curve has nothing to do with inflation. Now, this picture, the figure from the zeldovich zunyaev paper had a second part. And the second part plots the amplitude of the matter fluctuations as a function of wave number. And you also have oscillations in that as a consequence of these oscillations. And this is called baryon acoustic oscillations. Good. So this is predictions from 1970. Now, the key challenge, which was not answered in 1970, is how does one obtain a spectrum of primordial density perturbations? And inflation and cosmology is the first scenario based on causal physics, which yields such a spectrum, but it is not the only one. So now I will tell you the criteria for a successful early universe cosmology. But before doing that, I have to talk about the difference between horizon and Hubble radius. So by horizon, I mean the forward light cone of a point on the initial surface. So let's say just after the Big Bang, you look at the constant temperature surface and you ask how far could information from a point on that surface, how far could it have propagated? That, that's the horizon. So the horizon is a region of causal contact. Now, the Hubble radius is a local concept. It is a length which is defined as the inverse of the expansion rate. And the Hubble radius plays a role because fluctuations oscillate if the wavelength is smaller than the Hubble radius, and they are frozen in if the wavelength is larger than the Hubble radius. <clears throat> 
Now, in standard big bang cosmology, the Hubble radius is equal to the horizon, and therefore, the standard big bang cosmology has all of its problems, in particular, the horizon problem. Good. So, there are four criteria for a successful early universe scenario. First of all, the horizon has to be much bigger than the Hubble radius. That's in order to create the isotopy of the cosmic microwave background. Then, length scales, which we observe today, have to start out with a wavelength smaller than the Hubble radius at very early times. Otherwise, we have no local causal generation mechanism. If we start with vacuum perturbations, then the vacuum perturbations have to become possible. And this only happens if there's squeezing of the fluctuations, and this only happens on superposed scales. So fluctuations have to evolve over a long period of time on superposed scales. And finally, you also need to get a scaling around spectrum fluctuations. So these are the four criteria for a successful early universe scenario. And inflation, indeed, realizes satisfies all of these four criteria. So now I introduce you to a space-time sketch, which will appear various times. So the vertical axis is time, horizontal axis is physical spatial distance, and my period of inflation, which is a period of exponential expansion of space, starts at time key sub i and lasts until time key sub i. So this is a postulate of inflation. That's a phase of exponential expansion in the very early universe. Now, um, before inflation, there was a phase of usual expansion, and there was a big bang singularity before inflation. So if we now look at the horizon, the horizon grows like the Hubble radius in this early phase. But then once inflation starts, space expands exponentially. Therefore, the horizon expands exponentially. But the expansion rate is constant if you have exponential expansion. So the Hubble radius is constant. So you see that the exponential expansion of space makes the horizon exponentially larger than the Hubble radius. So this means that the first criterion of a successful early universe cosmology is satisfied. Now let's look at the red curve, which is the length scale of stuff we observe today. And again, as I already told you, in the early phases of standard Big Bang cosmology, this length scale is much larger than the Hubble radius. But if inflation lasts long enough, then because this length scale expands exponentially during inflation, if you trace it back, it can very well start out smaller in the Hubble radius and therefore allow a causal generation mechanism of fluctuations. Now, the fluctuations evolve on super Hubble scales, so they can be squeezed. And um, now, in this phase of inflation, you have constant energy density. And it is this constancy of the energy density which leads you to the scale invariance of the spectrum of fluctuations. So inflationary cosmology is one example where all of these four criteria can be satisfied but it is not the only one. A second one is a bouncing cosmology. So look at the bottom graph first. The bottom graph shows the scale factor, so the radius of a chunk of space, as a function of time. And in a bouncing cosmology, we assume that the universe starts at time t equals minus infinity in a contracting phase. And then there's some new physics that gives you the transition between contraction and expansion. And then you have standard Big Bang-like expansion. So this is what the scale factor is postulated to do in a bouncing cosmology. And I normalize my time axis that the bounce time is zero. Now this, the top graph, is the corresponding space-time sketch. The vertical axis is time. The horizontal axis is my co-moving coordinates. So in the expanding phase, the Hubble radius is increasing linearly. In the contracting phase, the Hubble radius is decreasing linearly. So this is what the Hubble radius is doing. The horizon is infinite because time starts at minus infinity. 
So the first criterion is satisfied, horizon much, much larger than the Hubble radius. Now, if we trace back the scale of inhomogeneities which we observe, then we find that, well, they start out smaller than the Hubble radius early on in the contracting phase. So criterion two satisfied. They propagate for a long time on super Hubble scales, criterion three satisfied. And well, if you start with vacuum fluctuations, and if the universe is dominated by cold matter, then the initial vacuum perturbations become scaling back. So bottom line is bouncing cosmologies can also satisfy all of the four criteria. Now a third scenario is uh, an emergent scenario. And here we assume that the universe starts with a phase, maybe a non-geometric phase, maybe just some static static phase, in any case, a phase which I can model as a static phase, scale factor constant in time. And then there's a phase transition, a phase transition that leads directly to the radiation phase of standard big bang cosmology. So this is a postulate in an emergent universe. And if you accept that postulate for what the scale factor does, you get the following space time sketch. So time, space, this is the phase transition. This is the static phase. This is the usual standard big bang phase of expansion. If the static phase lasts an infinite amount of time, the horizon is infinite. This is what the Hubble radius does. So Hubble radius is smaller than the horizon. Scales that we observe today start out smaller than the Hubble radius. Scales propagate on super Hubble scales. So the first three criteria are satisfied. And if you assume that the fluctuations in this phase are thermal, thermal fluctuations obey, um, obey the, hol um, holograph the holographic principle, then you find a scaling around spectrum at late times. So the bottom line of this discussion is that there is more than one early universe scenario. So this concludes the introduction. So maybe I'll pause briefly if there are any urgent questions. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have question. one question, but, uh, we, but can uh, we can discuss it later if you uh, okay. allow. Then we can, okay, yeah. so again, so the bottom uh, line at this point is that there are several early universe scenarios which can explain the isotopy of the microwave background, which can explain the data on the distribution of galaxies, microwave anisotopies. Inflation is one of them, but there are others. So now let's look at inflation. So inflation has become the paradigm of early universe cosmology. And the idea is that there was a phase of almost exponential expansion of space in the very early universe. So in this time period, as I illustrated in the previous slide. And as I illustrated, this solves some problems of standard Big Bang cosmology. And it provides a causal mechanism for the origin of structure. But it has an initial singularity. So now how do you get inflation? So if you assume that space-time is described by the Einstein-Hilbert action, then you need to have matter which is dominated by a rolling, a slowly rolling scalar field. And you, need the, you need the scalar field to be rolling slowly because the equation of state needs to be pressure almost equal to minus energy density. This e equation of state is necessary to get exponential expansion. And so the second hypothesis is that you start with quantum vacuum perturbations during inflation, and they then indeed evolve into fluctuations which are consistent with observations. So, okay, now, in case there are people who are scared when I mention the word scalar field, I want to make you less scared. I hope no one is scared by the electromagnetic field. And the scalar field is much simpler than the electromagnetic field. And this is a toy model for a scalar field, which we call the pencil model. So imagine a table, in the presence of regular gravity on the surface of the Earth in your laboratory. And at each point, 
on the table, you pin down a pencil. And the pencil is free to rotate back and forth. So at each point x on the table, there's a pencil, and the pencil is described by an angle phi. And the pencil can ro rotate back and forth. And so the angle will also depend on time. So now to make this model similar to a scalar field, I will connect nearest neighbor pencils with springs. So this is my toy model for scalar field. And this is in the context of, it feels Newtonian gravity. So there's a gravitational potential energy that each pencil feels. Good, so this is my toy model of a scalar field. And you see, if you now ask, what is the energy density of, the, of such a scalar field, there are three contributions. There's the kinetic energy coming from the motion of the pencil. There's the spring energy coming from the gradients of phi. The springs want to make the gradient zero. They want to make the pencils point in the same direction. And then there's potential energy. So this is the Lagrangian of a scalar field, and this is the energy density. Kinetic energy, tension energy, potential energy. And if you look at how these three terms contribute to the pressure, they contribute in this way. So kinetic energy contributes equally to energy density and pressure. Tension gives you negative pressure, but only slightly negative pressure. And if you want P equals minus rho, then you need the potential energy to dominate over gradients and over the kinetic energy. Good. So let's look at the equation of motion of the scalar field in an expanding background. And in an expanding background, this is the equation of motion for the scalar field, for the homogeneous scalar field. So the uh, um, acceleration, this is the damping due to the fact that space is expanding. And this is the force coming from the gravitational potential. So now if we want the uh, kinetic energy to be subdominant, it means that V prime has to be very small. So inflation requires scalar fields with potential energy, but with potential energy would satisfy this condition. V prime is derivative of V with respect to phi. So it's a slow roll condition. And this condition has to be satisfied not just at one time, but, but over a long time period. And this leads to a second condition. So these are the conditions required for inflation in this toy model. And if we want, the inflationary solution, the slow roll trajectory, to be a local attractor in initial position space, then you need field values which are bigger than m Planck, Planck mass. So these are the conditions for this toy model of inflation to work. So this is my lightning review of inflation. So if you just look at uh, Einstein gravity coupled to classical scalar fields, this is perfectly consistent. So as an effective field theory, nothing quantum, nothing unified, nothing quantum gravity, it is self-consistent. But self-consistent doesn't mean consistent. So the question which I want to turn to now is, does inflation emerge from a complete theory, from a theory which is complete in the ultraviolet? And a warning to the students, this is now the point where I depart from what is universally accepted to what is controversial. Okay. So over the past few years, there have been several obstacles against inflation put forwards. One of the set of obstacles goes under the name swampland conjectures, which is a statement that inflation is hard to realize in superstring theory. Superstring theory is the best theory we have that unifies all forces of nature at the quantum level. And the other set of objections comes from a generalization of Penrose's cosmic censorship hypothesis, which we call transplanting censorship conjecture. It is a causality and unitarity problem for inflation. It does not, it is independent of string theory. Okay. So let me first talk about the difficulty in embedding inflation to string theory. 
So now I don't know about the situation in Bangladesh, but uh, in North America, string theory right now has a very bad press because people say that with string theory, you can obtain anything you want. But this is actually not true. If you don't use string theory, if you stick to an effect of field theory, so scalar fields, classical gravity, then you can obtain anything you want. Any space-time dimension is OK. Any number of scalar fields is OK. Any shape of the potential is OK. Any field range is OK. No guidelines. In fact, it's a theorem that says, if you give me a scale factor and how it depends on time, any A of T, I can construct a scalar field model which reproduces this A of T. OK, so effective field theory is not very satisfying because, again, we can get anything we want with effective field theories. Now, in contrast, superstring theory is very constrained. It says that there are exactly 10 dimensions of space-time. All scalar fields which arise have a geometric origin. Therefore, the potentials of these scalar fields is determined by stringy effects, and so is the field range. So only a very small subset of all effective field theories is consistent with string theory. The rest lie in the swampland. And so this is the illustration. You have, at the level of effective field theories, a huge green swamp. But you don't want to live in the swamp. You want to live on a habitable island, which can be consistent with string theory. So they have some very small islands that stick out from the swamp. So I think this is something that you can appreciate a lot in Bangladesh. You want to live in a safe island, which is safe from um, typhoons. So what are the conditions for such a safe island? Well, first of all, the effect of field theory cannot be valid for field range bigger than M Planck. D is a constant of order one. Potentials for these scalar fields are determined by string theory, and they are steep. So V prime over V in Planck units is bigger than order one. And the second, well, if you have a local extremum of the potential, then that local extremum has to be sufficiently tachyon. So these are the criteria for a habitable island for an effective field theory consistent with string theory. So small field range, steep potentials, very tachyonic. Now, where do these uh, criteria come from? Well, I'll be quite brief here. So phi comes, is a string theory modulus field. The field range condition comes from the fact that if you move in this modulus space by a large amount, then there's a huge number of new string states that become massless and must be included. And the conjecture on the steepness of the potential comes from the fact that it is stringy effects which stabilize these scalar fields. And it is the stringy effects which give you steep potentials. And here's one example where you can read this up. OK, so now let's go back to inflation. Inflation requires large field ranges, very shallow potentials, and no tachyonic behavior. So you see that these are exactly the opposite of all of these criteria. So hence, we conclude that slow roll inflation is in the swampland, false vacuum inflation, so inflating when phi is fixed at a fixed value, that's in the swampland. There are ways to rescue uh, inflation, but uh, I can talk about this later. Good, so this was the first set of objections. The second set of, of objections come from uh, or form the Transplankian censorship conjecture. So this is independent of string theory. So if we go back to this space-time diagram of inflation, this you've seen several times now in the talk, here I added one more line, which is a Planck length. Now, if inflation lasts a long time, then length scales which we see today, for which we make observations, starts out smaller than the Planck length at the beginning of inflation. 
But we know that effective field theory cannot be trusted on length scales small than a Planck length. So already 20 years ago, we pointed out that new physics must enter into the calculation of fluctuations. But what Bedroya and Waffer now postulated a year ago is that actually we cannot have any transplankian modes ever exit the Hubble horizon. So basically say, stating that such a process, which I drew here, is prohibited from happening. In the same way that Penrose says that black holes with charge greater than a mass are prohibited. So here's a mathematical form of the TCC. It says that if you start at some initial time, and you look at the Planck length at this initial time, and you expand this length scale until a later time, then the result has to be smaller than the Hubble radius at this later time. So this is the mathematical form of the TCC. So here comes the justification. So if you look at a black hole with charge Q smaller than a mass, then this black hole has a horizon. So this horizontal axis is a radius. This uh, vertical axis is the time for the observer at infinity. So the existence of the horizon means that the observer will never see anything that happens inside the horizon and will never see the singularity. So the observer is shielded from the singularity. Now Einstein gravity allows for solutions with charge greater than a mass. For those solutions, there is no horizon. And this singularity is timeline. So in this setup, the poor observer, far away from I equals zero, gets information from the singularity. So, the observer cannot set up a Cauchy problem to determine the physics in the future and in the past. So this is a non-unitary setup and it's a singular setup. The observer is subject to the non-unitarity and to the singularity. Now what Penrose said is uh, generativity as an effective field theory allows such pathological solutions, but the correct ultraviolet physics will not will prohibit these solutions from existing. So this is Penrose's cosmic censorship hypothesis. So now, the way that we translate this uh, Penrose's argument to cosmology is the following. We say the thing black hole singularity is replaced by the transplankian region of Fourier modes, and the black hole horizon is replaced by the Hubble horizon. And so Penrose translated this way would say the observer measuring physics on wavelengths larger than the Hubble horizon must be shielded from transplanting modes. So this is one motivation for the TCC. And you see, it doesn't depend at all on quantum gravity, on string theory. Good. Now, the reason why we choose the Hubble horizon and not some other length scale in the above argument is the following. Fluctuations oscillate on sub Hubble scales. So uh, they never get squeezed and become classical. So we don't prohibit non unitary stuff from uh, entering the sub Planckian region as long as it remains sub Hubble, then it will never classicalize. So this is a conservative criterion to use the Hubble horizon. Good. Now, another justification is the fact that if we do quantum field theory in an expanding universe, the result is non-unitary. So in a quantum field theory, we need an ultraviolet cutoff, which is at a fixed physical length scale. And the Hilbert space in a quantum field theory is a product Hilbert space of harmonic oscillator Hilbert spaces for each uh, plane wave of the field. So now, if you have a fixed ultraviolet cutoff in an expanding universe, fixed physical ultraviolet cutoff, then that corresponds to a time-dependent co-moving ultraviolet cutoff. 
the wavelength of modes increases. So if you want to maintain fixed physical cutoff, you have to create modes continuously. That's extreme non unitary So we demand that the classical region be insensitive to this non unitarity and then we get to the TCC. So these are two uh, justifications for the TCC. So let's apply the TCC to inflationary cosmology. So here, this is the same sketch that you've, saw, you've seen before, time, space, physical length scale. This is a period of inflation. And we don't want the length scale, that length scales which are smaller than the Planck length at the beginning, we don't want them to become larger than the Hubble radius. This is the Hubble radius at the end of inflation. And so the TCC is marginally satisfied in this, in the way that I drew this. The Planck length at the beginning of inflation just barely reaches the Hubble radius at the end of inflation. So inflation cannot last any longer than I drew. On the other hand, if we want inflation to explain structures in the universe today, then the length scale corresponding to what we see today has to start out smaller than the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. And I drew this condition also as marginally satisfied in this plot. So this criterion says that inflation has to last sufficiently long. It gives you a lower bound on the duration of inflation. This, the TCC, gives an upper bound of the length scale of inflation. So now if you imagine that you move the Hubble radius towards the Planck length. So you make the energy scale of inflation higher and higher. It becomes more and more difficult to make these two constraints con consistent. Whereas if you take low scales of inflation, it becomes easier to satisfy the two criteria. So basically, if you demand the TCC, and if you demand that inflation yields a causal mechanism for generating microwave anisotropies, these are the two corresponding equations, you put them together and you find an upper bound on the energy scale of inflation. And this implies that the gravitational waves predicted by inflation will be utterly negligible in amplitude. So this R is the amplitude of the gravitational waves predicted divided by the amplitude of the fluctuations in matter. So inflation consistent with the TCC has to be low scale and it predicts negligible amount of gravitational waves. Okay, what about bouncing cosmologies? Does a TCC constrain bouncing cosmologies? Well, the answer is no, in no way. Because you see, in a bouncing cosmology, the length scales of fluctuations always remains much larger than the Planck length. It never approaches the Planck length. So as long as the energy scale of the bounce is smaller than the Planck density, then you are perfectly safe. If you look at the emergent scenario, again, in the emergent phase, the wavelength of fluctuations is constant. So fluctuations never approach this zone of ignorance. And so therefore, as long as the energy density in this emergent phase is smaller than the Planck density, you're completely safe. So, good. So inflation does not naturally emerge from superstring theory. And if you assume validity of the TCC, then inflation is highly fine-tuned and predicts negligible amount of gravitational waves. Good. And I showed you that the alternative scenarios to inflation are completely consistent with the TCC. Okay. Good. So now, <clears throat> since the alternatives to inflation are potentially on a more solid footing, given these ultraviolet considerations. Let's see how what we can do with them. So the most promising bouncing cosmology is called the ekperotic bounce, and it is based on describing gravity classically, and it assumes that the contracting phase is very slow. It is given by matter with an equation of state pressure divided by energy density, much, much bigger than one, compared to one third for usual radiation or zero for cold matter. Now, such a contracting phase can be as 
obtained by assuming that matter is dominated by scalar field, scalar field again, but this time with a negative exponential potential. So scalar fields with negative exponential potentials give you this kind of ekphorotic contraction. And during ekphorotic contraction, anisotropies are diluted, spatial curvature is diluted, the uh, homogeneous trajectory is a local attractor in initial emission space. So all the nice features that inflation has, the ekphorotic bounce has as well. Now, in addition, negative exponential potentials arise all over the place in string theory. Negative because the stable minimum in string theory is anti-decitor space, which corresponds to the scalar field with negative potential. And exponential because that's what the kind of potentials for moduli fields that typically arise. Okay. So here's a negative exponential potential. And you see it's described by an index square root of two over p. Now this gives rise to this evolution of a scale factor. We want p to be very small. We want w to be very large. p very small means the potential is steep. So if we solve the equation of motion, we find this evolution of a scale field. And if we ask how far does a scalar field move in a Hubble expansion time, we find that it moves a very, very short distance, very, very small distance. The potential is steep and the curvature is large. So hence, the scalar fields used for the ekphorotic scenario are completely consistent with the swamp land criteria. So the ekphorotic contraction is consistent with the swamp land criteria and with the TCC in contrast to slow rolling fish. Okay. Now, the challenge for the ekphorotic scenario is how do we get the transition from contraction to expansion? We need some new physics. So, and recently we realized that if we add one new ingredient to the effective field theory action, we can solve all of these three problems. And also we get a scenario which provides consistency relations for cosmological observables, so we can test the model. And this ingredient is simply a S-brain, uh, we couple an S, no, sorry, uh, let me, how, what do I do? Yeah, so the ideas are following. The universe is contracting, the energy density is rising. Once the energy density hits the Planck density, the string density, then you have a huge set of new degrees of freedom which have to be included in the action, therefore you have to include them in this way. A term in the action which lives at one point in time, this is called an S-brain, and with the S-brain you can get all of these nice features, and with the S-brain you can make predictions for cosmological observables, so you can make a prediction for the tilt of the spectrum of gravitational waves, it is related to the tilt of the density perturbations, and you can make a prediction for the amplitude of gravitational waves divided by the amplitude of the density perturbations. So, the ekphorotic scenario is consistent with the swampland, it's consistent with the TCC, and using this one new ingredient, you can get a bounce, make predictions for cosmological obs observables. Good. So, now the last thing I want to mention briefly is my favorite alternative to inflation, which is string gas cosmology. So this is a toy model based on the new degrees of freedom and new symmetries of string theory. So these are new degrees of freedom and new symmetries, which point particle theories, quantum field theories don't have. So if we look at a string and compare it to point particles, then well, a string has center of mass motion like point particles do. And if space is a torus, a radius r, the energy states, are quantized in units of one over r. But in contrast to point particles, strings can wind the space, and the energy of these winding modes is quantized in units of r. And they are oscillatory modes. A huge exponential tower of oscillatory modes. Good. So the new symmetry is related to the existence of both momentum and winding modes. Because you see, if you change r to 1 over r, so r is the radius of the spatial torus, and you interchange NNM, then the 
mass spectrum of spring states is unchanged. And string theorists tell me that it is a symmetry of perturbative string theory and a symmetry of non perturbative string theory. So this is a new symmetry and new degrees of freedom, which string theories have compared to point particle theories. So now let's consider a box of strings, a box of strings in thermal equilibrium with radius r. And let's start this box at a very large value compared to the spring scale. Then the energy will like to be in the low energy degrees of freedom, which are the momentum modes energy one over r. As you shrink the box, the energy of the momentum modes goes up. So the temperature goes up. But eventually, the energy density becomes so large that you can start to produce the oscillatory modes. The increase in the energy density levels off. And once you get to r smaller than 1 in string units, then the energy will start flowing into the winding modes, which are light at small values of r. So you see the temperature radius curve of thermodynamic strings has the same symmetry as I have here. Good. So therefore, in string theory, there is no temperature singularity. So now if you imagine that we have some uh, dependence of the temperature as a function of time, what could we get? We could either start out here in the symmetric state and eventually roll off. Or we could come in from here and go over here. So a priori, there are two temperature time graph trajectories that could follow. One of them, the green one, which is emergent. The other one, the purple one, which is bouncy. Good. I will now adapt the green curve. Okay, so now I want to make another argument. I want to make another argument which says that if you start from string theory, you cannot use effective field theory to describe the early universe. So this is a quantum argument. So I think all of you who've taken quantum mechanics will know that the position operator is given as a Fourier transform of the momentum operator. But in string theory, there is something that is dual to the momenta, namely the winding. So you can construct a dual position operator, which is the Fourier transform of the windings. So for each spatial dimension of your background, you have two position operators. Now, if R is large, the experimentalist will measure length in terms of the light degrees of freedom, which are the X modes. But if R is very small, then the observer will measure length in terms of the observable, in terms of the um, degrees of freedom, which are low mass at small R, which are the winding modes. So R is much smaller than one, the length is measured in terms of X tilde. And at X comparable, at R comparable to one, you have to include both. So at the string scale, at string scale densities, Usual effect of field theory based on ordinary of gravity will inevitably break down. So, and this is what an experimentalist would see if you put the experimentalist into a gas of strings at a finite temperature, and you ask the experimentalist to measure the length as a function of the mathematical radius of the box. This L is a mathematical radius of the box. This is what the observer will measure. Here, the observer will measure the physical length with the momentum modes, here with the winding modes. So the physically measured length never becomes zero. So the singularity is avoided. OK. So now I will assume that the universe starts out in this static phase where the temperature is close to the maximal temperature and that there's a transition to the uh, regular standard Big Bang phase of expansion. This transition is given actually by the decay of string winding modes. So then if you assume that perturbations originate as a thermal gas of strings, then you can compute both the 
density perturbations and the gravitational waves. And you do them in, in this three-step procedure. So you compute both the density perturbations, curvature perturbations, and the gravitational waves. I realize that I'm going fast here. So the cosmological perturbations are given by the density perturbations of the gas of strings. The gravitational waves are given by the off-diagonal pressure perturbations. You ask our string theory friends to tell us what these quantities are. This is the answer they give you for the density perturbations, given by specific heat capacity, holographic scaling. And there you get the answer, which is completely consistent with observations, a scaling invariant power spectrum of density perturbations with the right amplitude if you use string theorist's favorite value for the string length. And there's a slight red tilt for the fluctuations like for inflation. You can be gravitational waves from the off diagonal pressure perturbations. You get a scale invariant power spectrum, but with a slight blue tilt, unlike for inflation. Good. So this was a very brief um, survey of the two alternative scenarios. And I think I'm ready to conclude. So uh, the conclusions we to string gas cosmology is that string gas cosmology is consistent with, this, with string theory. So it's consistent with swap line criteria. And it is consistent with the TCC as I already showed. And the overall conclusions that I want you to carry away is that inflation does not naturally arise from superstring theory. And if you assume the GCC, inflation is highly fine-tuned. But the two alternative scenarios, which I illustrated, the ectorotic bounce and string gas cosmology, they are consistent with both the swamp line criteria and the GCC. So my provocative conclusions are that alternatives to inflation appear more promising in light of fundamental physics. So thank you for listening. So thank you, sir, uh, for your wonderful lecture. I have uh, a student, uh, I think a student have uh, enjoyed it a lot and uh, they have uh, learned a lot of things by your lecture. So uh, now we can go our uh, discussion session. So if you uh, allow uh, me, then I can start uh, yes, the discussion session. Okay, sir. So we have already got some questions. So first question is, what is the strongest evidence for inflation is it cmb temperature no you see what i argued at the beginning people usually say that this curve is evidence for inflation that's what you usually read but as i told you this red curve was predicted 10 years before inflation so this curve is predicted by all three scenarios which are illustrated by inflation, by string gas cosmology, and by the ectorotic scenario. So we don't have smoking gun evidence for inflation. Inflation is a nice toy model. It predicted a lot of things. It is still consistent with all of the data, but so are the alternatives. Okay, sir, thank you. So we have another question. So uh, does it mean that uh, slow plateau is finite in length as proposed by some plant uh, conjecture? So can you repeat the question? So does it mean that the slow roll plateau is uh, finite in the length as a proposed by some plant uh, conjecture? Right. right. So let me go uh, here to the Okay. And so the standard simple slow roll models are inconsistent with this one plant. But in, one way to save it is to change the equation of motion of the scalar field. And this is warm inflation. So if you have the inflation field interacting with other fields, then you can change this equation of motion. You can add a large friction term in this equation of motion. And if you add a large friction term in this equation of motion, you can get inflation with steep potentials. 
So this is how warm inflation can escape from this one. So did that address the question? Sorry? Did that answer the question? Okay, maybe, I think. So there is another question. So what is the primordial tensor? Primordial? Tensor. Primordial tensors. Yeah. Okay. So in general, what happens in any of the um, In this scenario, in this scenario, and yeah. in the inflationary scenario, what happens is that gravitational waves also get produced. So you start, like in inflation, you start out with vacuum perturbations in the gravitational waves, and they get squeezed. Now, the amplitude of the gravitational waves predicted is determined by the um, value of the Hubble constant during inflation. So the energy density predicted in gravitational waves is proportional to h to the 4. So these are my tensor perturbations. So you see, tensor perturbations are produced in inflation. They are produced in a bouncing cosmology. And they are also produced in the emergent scenario. Thank you, sir. So there is another question, sir. Can we please explain why inflation is not obtained by uh, in string theory? Uh, so, can, so why why, so what, uh, why inflation is not obtained in string theory? Okay, this goes back to the swamp line criteria. So you see, as I argued when discussing inflation, um, you you need a a shallow potential to get inflation, unless you use warm inflation. So. You need these criteria. Mm -hmm. So in string theory, you don't have the freedom to adjust the potential like you want. The potential is given to you. So you are starting with a, a nine dimensional space, one dimension of time. Six dimensions of space are compactified. And scalar fields, examples of scalar fields are radii of these extra dimensions. Now these radii, th these uh, dimensions are held together by strings. So the potential for phi coming from string theory is given to you by stringy effects. And you basically find that you don't get this condition. You find it. You find this condition. So the heuristic way for me to answer the question is, uh, whereas in effective fear theory, you have uh, the complete freedom to make the potential as flat as you want. You don't have that in string theory because in string theory, the scalar field is related to, for example, a radius of an extra dimension. And it is stringy effects that determine the motion of this extra dimension. Specifically, it is modular stabilization. Okay, thank you, sir. So we have another question. So I can add this question in your skin. So is uh, is the modern approach to cosmology oh, fundamentally? So maybe, uh, let me do the following. You are adding yeah. things. Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh -huh. now can, you can see the question. Is the modern approach to cosmology fundamentally flawed? Um, I I don't know. I would say it's fundamentally incomplete. Okay. And it is incomplete because we, because of a cosmological constant problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we have another uh, question. Okay. So thank you, sir. So there is another question. So why the shape of the galaxies are different? And which model can explain the shape of the galaxy? Now, the early universe cosmology cannot explain that because the, this, the answer to this question is related to late, later time cosmology. Okay. So another question, this is maybe the final question, sir. Uh, can we get a signature of the mode uh, polarization of CMB photon in inflationary model or string gas cosmology? The answer is yes. In fact, the key signature 
is we get a blue tilt of the spectrum of uh, B-mode polarization, as opposed to red tilt in inflation. And we, we in fact get, uh, we, we can predict the amplitude of the tilt. So the answer is yes, we have a clean signature. Okay, sir, thank you. So uh, it's, uh, we have to conclude the, uh, all the questions. So we can uh, conclude our discussion session if you allow us. So uh, thanks again, sir. So on the behalf of the Department of Physics, I'd like to say thanks again, because uh, we know you are too busy. Uh, you are in Europe uh, for your research trip, maybe, but uh, still you give us uh, time for our student. And uh, I, I'm sure actually that uh, students have enjoyed lots and learned a lot of new things. So uh, they, they actually, uh, today, uh, but they, they become very happy because they, uh, they can uh, learn a lot of things from the uh, famous uh, cosmologist from Canada. So uh, we actually very happy and our department uh, uh, want to thank you because uh, we actually try to uh, motivate our student in this corona pandemic situation. And uh, uh, in this regards, you accepted our invitation. So thanks, sir. And hopefully uh, in near future, we'll, uh, we'll arrange another session with you if you have a free time, sir. Okay. So thank you again so, for the invitation yeah. and for listening. Okay, sir. So bye for today. Bye. We'll see you. Okay, sir. Bye.